have with us uh, Professor S. Pani Selvam, former professor, Department of Philosophy, University of Madras, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So without further ado, I'm handing over the mic to you, sir. Please deliver your lecture. Professor Pani Selvam. Uh, respected Professor Tiwari Ji, uh, Professor R.P. Singh and uh, friends uh, uh, who are present in BHU and friends uh, who are uh, on, uh, online and my dear students. At the outset, I am grateful to Professor uh, Anand Mishraji for giving me this nice opportunity of sharing my uh, views with regard to interpretation of Advaita in the contemporary philosophical discourse. Here, I would like to talk about one important uh, contemporary thinker uh, who has contributed uh, substantially uh, in contemporary philosophy uh, in the context of Advaita Vedanta. Now, prior to that, I would like to state that uh, many of our contemporary philosophers have given a new methodology for understanding our own tradition uh, using the linguistic model, the phenomenological model, and the comparative model. And uh, by using these models, we are able to understand uh, uh, Indian philosophical tradition, especially Advaita, uh, in a beautiful way. Uh, not only Advaita, but other systems of philosophy also, of course. Uh, for example, Subhijivan Bhattacharya's usage of uh, mathematical logic to represent uh, Navyanaya, then B.K. Matilal's uh, uh, understanding, usage of analytical philosophy to understand Nyaya realism, then J.N. Mohanty's uh, application of Husserlian concept uh, of phenomenology to Indian philosophical problems, and Ganesh Mishra's uh, methodology of understanding the linguistic philosophy in Advaita Vedanta, then our Balasubramanian's uh, methodology of using phenomenological model for understanding Advaita Vedanta. These are some of the uh, well-known methods which are very much available in contemporary philosophical discourse. But I would like to introduce to you uh, one important thinker. Uh, his name is uh, Ramakrishna Puligandla. Perhaps uh, some of you might be aware of this name. And if my professor, my good friend uh, uh, Godavaris Mishra is there, he would uh, uh, also accept that uh, Puligandla is a very important philosopher of uh, this century who has seen uh, Advaita from the analytical tradition. And uh, he has made uh, uh, analytical as well as uh, the phenomenological model in order to understand Advaita uh, tradition from a new perspective. I would like to call his uh, method of methodology as a comparative uh, and analytical, comparative hyphen analytical methodology without deviating from the tradition to interpret Shankara in the contemporary understanding. And this method, uh, that is the comparative analytic method has certain advantages. For example, it has not reduced everything to analysis and hence uh, the fallacy of reductionism is completely avoided. And secondly, this method of uh, Ramakrishna Puligan law allows us to think and apply the Western methodology to Indian philosophical problems to ponder over the question why very similar puzzles evoke uh, different responses from different people, as uh, suggested by Professor B.K. Matila. Now, Ramakrishna Puligan law's uh, scholarship uh, is well known in Indian philosophy because he has used. Uh, the Western methodology or the Western background in order to show the novelty uh, which is very much present in Advaita Vedanta. For example, Puligandla applies, uh, of course, Puligandla is from uh, uh, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, and later he settled in US. But he is a uh, well known uh, uh, phenomenologist, he is well aware of uh, the Advaita Vedanta and also is very much familiar with uh, uh, modern logic and uh, philosophy of science. Uh, so what he did was he applied the Big Bang theory and uh, Derrida's deconstruction and the Western philosophy of language to understand uh, Advaita Vedanta. And I would like to mention two of his very important uh, papers published in Madras University. That one is uh, Consciousness and the World in Advaita Vedanta. Uh, here he looks at the doctrine of uh, Adhyasa from the analytical standpoint. And also another important uh, paper of uh, Professor Puligandla is uh, 
an analytical interpretation of Advaita Vedanta. And there is also another important paper, Immanence and Transcendence in the Upanishadic Teaching. In all these papers, he could uh, successfully give the analytical uh, as well as the phenomenological understanding of Advaita Vedanta. That uh, actually makes him uh, something unique in the field of uh, or in the in the uh, in the in the uh, Advaitic tradition. Now, a phenomenon. He defines uh, uh, what is a phenomenon. He says a phenomenon is anything that is or can, in principle, be an object of consciousness. That is, he is trying to develop a phenomenological method. So he tries to define what a phenomenon is. That is how a phenomenon is always connected to object of consciousness. So he says every phenomenon can be assigned either both spatial and temporal, and it coordinates with the, the temporal world. So this means what, uh, according to Puligan lies, what exists in time and uh, which is bounded by time is something related to consciousness. And Brahman cannot be a phenomenon because uh, it transcends everything. Of course, there are many uh, uh, phenomenologists, Indian phenomenology, like uh, Jayan Mohanty and our Balasubramaniam, who have made some attempt in this direction. But what makes Puliganda unique is that he shows uh, the major distinction that exists between Brahman on the one side and the object of consciousness or the empirical world, where he argued that Brahman cannot be a phenomenon because it transcends everything. So he says Brahman as a pure uh, uh, and objectless consciousness, whereas Jiva is an object of consciousness and not consciousness itself. Here lies the major uh, distinction because uh, when he defines uh, uh, or when he interprets Brahman by saying that it is objectless consciousness, he shows how it transcends uh, the ordinary understanding of consciousness, which often, quite often, uh, is applied to uh, uh, empirical things. So according to, to Puligandla, Atman is uh, pure and consciousness itself, it is objectless uh, and consciousness. So Brahman, according to him, is immanent in this sense, and uh, all existence and multiplicity are the manifestations of Brahman. Similarly, he says Brahman is transcendent in the sense that uh, Brahman either as a power whose manifestation or the world of phenomena or as pure objectless consciousness cannot in principle be experienced as a phenomenon or, or object of consciousness. So it is very clear from his approach that in the experience of Brahman as transcendent, there is always objectless consciousness and the nowhere known distinction is transcended or it is absent. Now what uh, he is trying to argue is that all phenomena, except, uh, uh, without exception, are reducible to Brahman, which is not itself a phenomenon. This is a major distinction he shows uh, between uh, uh, Brahman and other entities. So according to the Bra according to Puligandla, Brahman is unmanifest, pure, object-like consciousness is experienceable when one eliminates all mental modification. So he is very right in saying that uh, in the experience of Brahman as transcendent, there cannot be any distinction among the knower, known, and the act of uh, knowing. These distinctions belong, belong to the domain of dualistic ways of uh, knowing, but not in the experience of Brahman, where the dualistic understanding is completely absent. Now, keeping this as a backdrop, he would uh, uh, tell us that how the consciousness which is identical to Brahman is formless and nameless. And he says, when everything that can be thought away is thought away, what remains is pure objectless consciousness, the ultimate residue. Now, by developing this uh, phenomenological method or by seeing the phenomenological method in Advaita, he is trying to argue that this method is quite different from that of uh, Husserl and Sartre. Because uh, he says uh, for Husserl and Sartre, consciousness is always uh, intentional and that is what is called the object consciousness of something. Now, the question that uh, can be raised here is this. 
whether consciousness can be non intentional this is a very important question according to pligan law whether consciousness can be non intentional since consciousness cannot be empty it must always be relational and hence intentional so bare consciousness uh, which is devoid of uh, objects is unimaginable so this means pligan law's methodology though is remarkable uh, like that of uh, the method developed by uh, Professor uh, R. Balasubramaniam and others, I would always uh, see that there is uh, a, a problem that is always pricking in the methodology which he has uh, used in order to interpret, I mean, he, the methodology which he has used in order to interpret Advaita Vedanta by focusing on the phenomenology. Why? Because my, my contention is, the question is this, whether consciousness can be non-intentional. Since uh, consciousness cannot be empty, it must be always relational and hence intentional. So bare consciousness, sorry right? To interrupt you, Devoid sir. of objects. Yeah. So sorry Hello? to interrupt. Please, please conclude, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bare consciousness, which is devoid of objects, is uh, unimaginable. So this uh, two relation, that is, uh, in quote, two relation. That is how objects are always in relation to uh, how consciousness is always in relation to something, some objects or other, is uh, a little problematic if we apply the Advaitic methodology. On the other hand, if we use uh, the methodology which is de developed by Ramanuja, it is very clear that Ramanuja's uh, position is quite acceptable for the main reason that Ramanuja is the one who speaks about uh, that consciousness is always. Uh, uh, relational. Of course, there are Indian scholars like Professor R. Balasubramanian who argue that the Advaitins have transcended the methodology of uh, the phenomenology developed by Israel and others. But how far that is true is uh, uh, is uh, quite uh, doubtful. And uh, the, one, with one more point, I stop. The uh, methodology which Puligan uh, has adopted is something no doubt is remarkable. For example, he tries to deconstruct Advaita Vedanta because all of us know that deconstruction has been uh, playing a very important role in the Western uh, uh, methodology, especially Derrida's uh, uh, application of a deconstructive method to philosophical discourse is something remarkable. And uh, he talks about, uh, Ramakrishna Puligandla talks about uh, uh, super de superimposition. This is uh, the phrase which he uses and he says, uh, the methodology with uh, which uh, the Advaitins use is quite different from that of uh, uh, um, from that of uh, Derrida's deconstruction. And here he says that uh, this methodology de developed by uh, Indian philosophers is something uh, which uh, transcends uh, the methodology of uh, uh, Derrida. So he shows by quoting uh, uh, Harold Coward, who has written a very beautiful book on. Uh, Derrida's deconstruction in Indian philosophy. Polygon uh, law argues that uh, our methodology, that is Indian methodology, would easily transcend uh, or it, it avoids some of the difficulties which arise in the context of uh, the Western deconstructive method developed by uh, uh, Derrida and others. So I'll conclude by saying the methodology which uh, we find in contemporary Indian philosophers' approach, like Polygon law and others is something really remarkable for the main reason that they could successfully use the western methodology in order to show that advaitic tradition is not alien to some of the methods which uh, we have developed so there, though there are certain difficulties in accepting puligan uh, position fully he has given a new insight like professor r balasubramaniam and uh, that insight has to be taken seriously in order to show that how advaita could uh, transcend the Western phenomenological method or the Western deconstructive approach, which uh, we have been talking about in Western philosophical discourse. So this is my position that I would like to say that uh, some of the methods which you have developed in uh, Western tradition, like phenomenology, linguistic or hermeneutics or postmodern tradition can be seen in Indian tradition also. It is not something new to us. It is not something alien to us. The thing is, you must uh, know how to look at the Indian tradition so that the beauty of Indian tradition could be seen. With this, I would like to uh, conclude and I thank you very much for 
is wonderful thank opportunity thank, thank you. you sir thank you so very much